Greetings and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the HIV Cure Research Update webinar today. My name is Kyle Shavasta and I am the Public Programs Associate here at Philadelphia Fight. We are honored and excited to have this webinar today to discuss uh, Cure Research as a preamble to um, many workshops and a lot of information is going to be prolifer proliferated at this year's uh, Prevention and Education Summit. Um, I am excited to introduce Dr. Louis Montaner and Kenneth Lynn, both part of the Beat HIV Delaney Collaboratory and the Wistar Institute. <laughs> Greetings, Ken and uh, Louis. How are you both doing? Hey, good morning. Doing well, thank you. Good morning. So I'm just going to go over some slight house rules and then we can go into the webinar. So to all the participants, uh, you have entered on mute. Um, you will remain on mute for the remainder of the webinar. If you look on the uh, toolbar, you will see that there is a Q and A box. In that question and answer box, please place any pressing questions into that box and we will answer it at the end of the webinar. Um, so, without further ado, um, we are excited and we may begin. Yes. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this uh, discussion on HIV cure. Uh, as, I, as already noted, joining me is Kenneth Lynn, who is our research nurse and coordinator of all our trials and interface with the community. So, his feedback at the end regarding uh, community engagement uh, is also going to be very important. So in, I think as a, by way of introduction, uh, I've been at the Wister Institute for about 25 years and in, during this period, I've basically focused on HIV research and how to best to engage an understanding of the disease. And the next slide uh, shows you uh, a pretty good trajectory of how time has passed. And yet at the same time, I'm fortunate to have as a partner, Philadelphia Fight, that uh, signed on very early on on the quest to understand the HIV uh, infection in people living with HIV and to this day become is one of our central uh, key collaborators uh, in this uh, trajectory. Next slide. I think it goes without saying that since 1995 antiretroviral therapy has changed the trajectory of people living with HIV. Next slide. In that it has allowed for expected survival to have increased in individuals that can sustain uh, suppression with their medications. And this success in being able to stay on medication and suppress viral load, next slide, has really allowed for the concept that in spite of the fact that HIV pandemic continues to generate new infections and being a challenge for therapy uh, outreach, for those that can sustain therapy and succeed in maintaining an undetectable status, they can actually, and in, within their therapy management, stop the ability of transmission. So there is a second uh, line to the cure agenda that acknowledges that if we were able to identify everyone that was infected and placed them on antiretroviral therapy, we would end the HIV pandemic from moving forward. But because of the challenges that are in front of us in making that happen, we also need to reconcile what are alternatives to end the HIV pandemic through not only treatment, but also through a cure. Next slide. And I think in that narrative, then it was really an important finding when there was a case report of Tim Brown that showed that it was possible to have HIV virus not return to someone that was otherwise infected uh, and on antiretroviral therapy. Before his case, there had been no identified circumstance by which we could even consider that that was possible. Next. And in this particular case, it was the dynamic of understanding of how the virus gets into a cell. And in this cartoon, you're seeing a cartoon of the virus that is actually next to two other 
blue and green uh, diagrams that are basically representing the two molecules that the virus needs to enter a cell. And in the context of Tim Brown, when he was being treated for cancer and therefore was his body was irradiated to remove his immune system and in, in that case also remove the virus that was within the immune system that was being eradicated, the cells that he received were lacking the green components of those two steps. That basically the cells that he received had CD4 but did not have CCR5. And that resulted in the inability of the virus to return once he had received this uh, strategy. Now, many consider that, well, why isn't that more accessible as a strategy in general? And the reason is because any transplant, whether it be blood or heart or liver or lung, requires a matching, otherwise your body will reject it. And that uh, dynamic of you being able to accept someone else's uh, uh, tissue makes a risk for you to fail this strategy. And that failure in the context of a blood transfusion, a blood transplant, like in this case, a bone marrow transplant, can actually be lethal. You can die from it. So when you then consider, do I want to be on my therapy that can sustain my life expectancy and survival, or do I want a bone marrow transplant, the risk of death of the bone marrow transplant makes this option not really something that we want to promote. So then we get into the point of if a cure is possible because of what happened to Tim, are there other reasons apart from, uh, in general, that we would also want to pursue a cure? Next slide. And I think here is where we think about the potential benefits of having an alternative to continuous therapy. And it goes without saying that the limited access to generate and maintain treatment, the unknown aspect of long-term side effects, the expense, and those living with HIV also need to address the stigma issue of the fact that in our community, unfortunately, there are still issues of stigma that prevent people from getting tested. There are also criminalization laws that are still in the books in many states that burden people living with HIV with what is an on times unreasonable expectations of uh, disclosure and in spite of the fact that they're suppressed. So if we were able to have a cure, I think that the dialogue around criminalization, around stigma, around the burdens would change. So when we think about why we want a cure, I think about the global implications, but I think also think about the individual implications that may be possible because we may change the narrative of HIV infection uh, from what it is today. Next slide. So I think that we still need to define this term cure, and we're going to come into that uh, next. I also want to review with you what's been in the media relative to uh, what has been proposed as cure outcomes. And lastly, I'm going to perhaps give you a sense of where are we going with this concept into the future relative to what can we expect over the research that's underway? And most uh, at the end, we're going to talk more specifically about the activity that's happening here in Philadelphia. Next slide. I think that when we talk about what does the cure mean, I think everyone would agree that a, uh, any cure would mean that you would not need to be on medication. Now, interest, intriguingly, we also know that people that have high risk behavior should be. Uh, considering to protect themselves from new infection. So one of the uh, intriguing conversations that sometimes we have with the community is the fact that, yes, we can take away, we can hope to take away the burden of daily treatments uh, if you are HIV infected, but if you intend to continue having uh, unprotected sex or not necessarily uh, being in a committed long-term relationship where that's not a component, then you may still have to consider PrEP in relation to protecting yourself. So the issue of not having ongoing medication really refers to the burden of being dependent on that for control of viral replication, but it does not mean that you will not ever again have to take 
any sort of antiretroviral therapy because in the context of PrEP, if you are indicated to have it, then that may be something in the future still. We also want a cure that doesn't have any symptoms that may be long-term because of the strategy that gave you the cure. We also don't want to have virus return. And I think here's where the difference in some of the definitions come in that some individual, some strategies are looking to maintain viral replication low, but not eradicate it. And in, we know that, for example, elite controllers and people that can maintain very low undetectable levels of virus can prevent a lot of the immunodeficiency outcomes that come with high viral load. So one definition of a beneficial outcome would be that if there was a strategy that could allow someone to stop their medication, but the viral replication would not be observed. So even if I was able to document that the virus was still there, can I take someone into a profile that would be similar to an elite controller? Now, preferably, we want to know if we can get someone to what would be a status of no virus. And this is more of what we refer to as a sterilizing cure, or basically that we cannot see HIV anywhere. Next slide. And I think in the, in the media, we've seen these four types of uh, instances being featured at different times. We just talked about Timothy Brown, that I'm thankful to say that he's well, and he continues to be a, a role model for the cure research overall and what is possible. This year, we heard of another patient that underwent a very similar strategy that one Tim Brown did, and he also has been without detectable virus still, to suggest that what happened in the case of Tim Brown may be not a one-off, that, that the concept of taking away the co that core receptor or that molecule that the virus needs may be very important, so that research may prioritize how we can do that independently of a bone marrow transplant. Now, in the context of the Mississippi baby, this was a, a newborn that received treatment early on and the virus did not return for quite some time. So there was, again, the expectation that maybe early treatment was very important. And it's still the case that early treatment can delay viral rebound because that was the case in the Mississippi baby. So that concept still remains. But from the point of view of a long-term cure, I think that the Mississippi baby showed that that was not the ultimate outcome. And the Visconti cohort is this group of patients that was treated early and can remain low level of virus even in the absence of therapy. So this is more similar to the concept that we talked about relative to the functional cure. So when you think about 36 million people infected with HIV worldwide, and you look at this slide, one of the, I guess, uh, items that may give us pause is that we don't have a lot of individuals that have succeeded in maintaining control or in establishing a cure. So we still have to acknowledge that our research effort is really trying to give us some hope that we can get to outcomes such as these. But the expectation that we can take 36 million people and put them into a cure I think at this point is unrealistic. I think what we can expect is that our research effort will bring us closer to what's happened in these individuals. And if we're lucky, maybe we'll hit uh, that magic bullet that gives us the answer. But our expectations in our research is that we want to get closer and closer to these outcomes that these individuals have shown us. And next slide. The reason that we have some pause into the challenge ahead of us is that we know that the virus persists in multiple tissues in the body, so that whatever strategy we have to test needs to get access to all the tissues where the virus may persist. Because we also have the expectation that one virus that can initiate replication may be sufficient to get the whole thing started again. So that if I have a strategy that is going to work, it needs to get rid of everything everywhere. Next slide. The next barrier that we face is the notion that the, what we refer to as the quiet infected cell, that cell that after treatment for with antiretroviral therapy can persist, it's not a cell that exists in high numbers. It's a cell that is thought to be like one in a million. 
So in this particular image, you're seeing a swimming pool with one million plastic balls. And what the cure strategy needs to accomplish is to be able to find and remove one in a million of these balls to actually know that you have gotten rid of where the virus could reemerge. And you can obviously tell that that's not going to be a simple uh, strategy because you would need to be able to find it before you can remove it. And with that context, next slide, we can maybe review some of the current strategies that are being considered in order to do that. Next slide. One strategy that has been very popular is this, and popular I mean that there are many studies trying to do this in many different ways, is this concept of waking up the virus from where it's hiding. So that there are many strategies that are looking to stimulate an HIV infected cell that may be quietly sitting in your body to express the virus and as a consequence be known to the immune system so that it can be removed. Next strategy, next slide. Another common strategy is immunotherapy. This is the notion that we're going to give the the individual some unique property that will allow their immune system to be more powerful or more able to control the virus than if they were not receiving this therapy. And in all of these strategies, we expect that the hit on the infected cell is going to be disproportionate. That is going to be something that only the therapy can allow for it to happen. And in the in the, in the images that you see in the lower right, you're seeing the interaction between two cells where the bottom cell is killing the cell on the top. And this is a process that a lot of the immunotherapy strategies are trying to promote. In this case, you're seeing the image of a cancer cell, but in the context of HIV, you would have an HIV infected cell, which would be the one that the cell of your own body, which is the blue one on the knee, is trying to find and trying to kill. Next slide. The third major concept is this concept of gene therapy, where we now take the technologies that we have available and we manipulate the cell in order for it to be able to express a gene that is going to be giving the cell a new power to kill an infected cell, or we're removing a gene that we believe is central to the way the virus gets into a cell. And we've already talked about that in the case of the Tim Brown case, where he received cells that were lacking one particular protein, or the CCR5. Now, he received cells from someone that had a natural mutation that lacked this molecule. But gene therapy trials now are looking to take cells out from an individual, remove the CCR5 outside in the laboratory, and then reintroduce those cells back to a person to determine, are these cells able to survive and persist in a preferential way? And one of the trials that we have here in Philadelphia about to start are doing just that. Next slide. So when we then look at a, what does a cure trial look like, I think one common theme is that everyone is on antiretroviral therapy. Next. After that, we want to determine that they have a good immune system in the context of that therapy and that the HIV replication is inhibited, that there is no known low levels of blips or low level viremia in an individual. Next slide. Next. Then we usually provide some degree of immunotherapy or intensification next into the antiretroviral therapy itself. <clears throat> meaning that some immunotherapy or some antibody or some strategy that we would expect could activate the reservoir. Next. And in this context, we can introduce steps that try to awaken the virus. Like, for example, we just talked about awakening as a strategy. And if all of this were to be working in our favor, then you can see that you started with a level of virus before anything was done. In red, you receive strategies that either empowered your immune system or allowed the virus that was quiet to come out. And if that is happening in the context of antiretroviral therapy, the virus doesn't have anywhere to expand. And next, if that all works to our favor, 
then we should expect that if we do an analytical treatment interruption, we will get a readout as to how efficient that process worked because we currently don't have a, a way to measure the residual virus in someone on art that is consequential to a rebound or consequential to the virus returning after you stop therapy. So we have to stop therapy on a trial in order to see where we are, in order to see whether this worked. And hopefully the expectation next is that we would see an outcome that would be what we would be trying to achieve. Next slide. So when we then come back to Philadelphia in this context, I think that we've been going towards this trajectory, like I mentioned, for uh, many years. And in, the co in relation to HIV cure, we have two major activities locally that have been moving forward towards a cure-directed strategy. One is the use of interferons, which are a molecule that can awaken or strengthen your immune system. And the other one is gene therapy, where there have been strategies already here in Philadelphia that have been tested where we can take the cells out and manipulate them and give them back to an individual. Next. Some of the information that we've been able to document here in Philadelphia is the fact that what you're seeing here in black is the number of individuals or the percent of individuals that can remain suppressed after you stop antiretroviral therapy. And you can see on the bottom where it says weeks after art interruption that that black line starts to drop very close to the bottom which means that people are becoming viremic as soon as they stop antiretroviral therapy. And the red and the blue line, you can see stay above the black line. And that's because those individuals are on interferon, and as a consequence, they can sustain the level of control to a degree that you would not expect if they were not receiving interferon. Next, and most importantly for us, the observation that is being highlighted here is that if you take rectal tissue from the individuals that are on this trial, and this is <clears throat> done in the same day, you know, the individual comes in, there is a biopsy that's taken very close to the uh, rectum, so that it's actually a procedure that takes about half an hour or less, and they walk out right after that, so this is not something <clears throat> very invasive from the point of view of getting the tissue but it gives us a window as to the level of virus that you can see in tissues, which is different than what you could potentially measure in the blood. And when you look at this tissue, these little red arrows are showing points where you can detect the detection of virus in someone's tissue. And what we are enthusiastic about is that the, those red arrows are very evident before the interferon treatment, but we cannot find them after the interferon treatment to suggest that we're having an impact on reducing the amount of virus in a person. Next slide. And with those results, and with the onset of AIDS money for cure-directed research that Obama made possible, next slide, we were able to start what we call a randomized trial, where we're formally testing what is the impact of adding interferon or not to your antiretroviral therapy. And this is a very complicated slide that you see in Front of you, but the bottom line is that we basically were testing those three bars that you see. The green is those receiving interferon, and the one without green is just staying on your regular antiretroviral therapy. And the basic question are, are the two green ones that represent those groups going to be different than the blue one uh, at the end of the study? Next slide. And I think we just reported this year, uh, earlier in the year, the results of this particular study to document that there was a reduction that was possible to be detected in those receiving interferon when compared to just staying on antiretroviral therapy. Next slide. So what does this mean to you today? And I think that next slide, what it means is that we now have coalitions of research teams around the country, and we have one right here in Philadelphia, that are trying to move these results into clinical studies that can move us even further ahead. Next slide. For our BEAT HIV collaboratory here in Philadelphia, we have three big objectives that we're trying to accomplish. On the first objective is to learn how to find the virus more efficiently in someone's system. Where does it reside? Because if we can learn more about where the, the virus is, we can learn more how to measure it after any therapy to determine that it is gone. 
The second is moving this interferon uh, result forward, but now adding antibodies that can amplify or make even more powerful the effect of interferon that we just reviewed. And this is a trial uh, which is called B2, and, and it will be opening this year. And lastly, the gene therapy trial, the chimeric antigen receptor is the scientific term for the strategy, but the bottom line is that you're getting the cells out, you're manipulating their genes to give them features to make them able to kill better and also to protect them by giving, taking away that molecule that was central for Team Brown's case and then giving them back to the person and determine if I give you a cell now that cannot be infected and can also kill, would that cell persist and allow to clean your, basically target all the HIV infected cells that are remaining in your body. Next slide. And these two trials, as I mentioned, are, these are their official type of, of, of names, interferon plus the two antibodies or the gene therapy trials, next, and they're basically starting the context of uh, screening as we hope to actually start them this year. Next slide. And so that if you have anyone that is interested to learn more about this particular effort, or you think that your communities may have an interest to learn more about the overall activity around this, next, I would direct you to Ken, who's on the line, uh, and Ken also was instrumental in some of the studies that we just reviewed that could be uh, a person of, uh, to be contacted. Next slide. Now, we also, obviously, uh, this was uh, a video that we were going to show, but unfortunately, it was very pixelated, so we're going to pass on that. Next slide. Um, but the, you need, we certainly also uh, want to be part of the dialogue of what does it mean to be in cure-directed studies in the community, not just with our studies in specific, but in general. And we're basically partnering with Philadelphia Fight to and our community advisory board to sponsor workshops during the upcoming AIDS Education Month, which is happening now in June. Next slide. And in June 11th, there's going to be at least uh, five different workshops that are going to be sponsored on both HIV research updates on a more broader uh, sense, uh, featuring uh, our CAP uh, members uh, speaking uh, basically about their own experience. We're also going to have individuals talk about how collaboration works within community and research teams and the difference between undetectable and untransmissible versus being on an HIV cure study. And also, we're going to be uh, moving, uh, putting out three videos under a premiere that this, video, this slide before the one I showed was going to give you a preview of one of them, and they're going to be featured and released in June 11th uh, that deal with interviews and more narrative from people working on the HIV cure directed research. Next slide. Now, if any of these topics are interesting to you and you want to get involved, there's a lot of opportunities for involvement in our community here in Philadelphia. Uh, our community advisory board is very active in conjunction with Philadelphia Fight and us, we become a community engagement group together and a lot of these uh, get moved uh, as a lot of our agenda gets moved because everyone contributes uh, to where we want to, to get to. Next slide. We also have a website that you can access, beathiv.org, that summarizes our objectives, our trial initiatives, lists everyone that's involved in this effort under our team, and you can learn more about our group in that website. And lastly, next slide, I think that it goes without saying that without the community support and the endorsement of where we all wanna get to together, this work would not happen. So that the at some point we all are very hopeful that our joint efforts would get us to, uh, to, to a time where HIV is going to be cured and that we all hope that within our lifetime, we will be able to see that. Last slide. And this is a slide of our Beat HIV group uh, in June of last year, uh, relative to our yearly meeting, which are, are this June, we're reconvening the group again for a progress of what has happened over the last year. So with that, I will end my discussion and uh, perhaps allow Ken, who's on the line, to provide any additional uh, insights on the uh, pure 
uh, directed research perspective from the community uh, that he has experienced uh, before we close. Thank you. Thanks very much, Luis. Uh, the interest from the community has been very strong and uh, the individuals who can ultimately participate in one of our trials beyond their interest is sometimes limited by their personal medical background. Uh, we can only hope to work with the most stable and the most healthy individuals in these clinical trials in order to have a commonality amongst the individuals, as well as focusing on their safety for their participation, as safety of the individual participant is a key uh, point of interest for us, as we only want people to participate if they can do so safely. In addition, those people who can't participate often go into the community and become what I've coined as uh, community ambassadors into support groups that they may belong to, churches, family members, and talk up our trial. So they may not be able to participate directly, but they are able to be a spokesman for us within the community. And then finally, piggying back on uh, Luis's point on the CAB, the CAB has been instrumental in helping us gather information and questions that we need to touch on in order to further uh, get support from the community. And uh, the CAB is a contact person within Dr. Montaner's lab is Beth Peterson. And I wanted to highlight her phone number as 215-898-3934. And Beth would be your contact person should you not be able to do uh, the commitment of a trial, but you wanted to be able to support and offer feedback to the team, Beth would be able to be your point person with regards to considering being part of our uh, community advisory board. And so we're actively pre-screening right now for the Beat HIV 2 trial. And again, uh, recruitment has uh, been strong for these pre trial screens where we're testing to ensure that individuals are uh, reactive to the antibodies that we plan to use in the upcoming trial. So all good news, but we need to continue to get the word out and answer any questions that individuals have with regards to our curative uh, trials. And I, I think that the best use of the remaining time would be to open it up to any questions that individuals may have. Yes, um, I, I actually have a question for both of you. So there's um, a, a fervent, uh, fervent way, way with which people are sharing um, HIV cure research articles, you know, and I feel like a lot of news sources just, you know, publish them in sensational ways. What is some advice you would give to folks who are excited about sharing the information? And what are some best practices when like filtering through kind of like articles and whatnot, like what to look for and what to steer clear of? I think any, any report that does not include the information of individuals that have received the strategy, that have been monitored after stopping their antiretroviral therapy for at least two years uh, following that interruption is all going to be preliminary to something that we know could work. So a report on a cell line on someone's laboratory, a report on one individual where they cannot detect virus and they're still on antiretroviral therapy, a result of, a, of an animal model where they saw that the virus did not return, all of those are good indicators that the work should continue, but they're not indicators that those are strategies that are now available to someone on antiretroviral therapy. So the difference is there is excitement about the activity in the field that could be shared because there is work that is being done, but the excitement should not be that the cure is right next to us because of those results, because the barrier to show that something works is very high, and that is 
a strategy that can be tolerated given to individuals that are living with HIV. Those individuals stop their antiretroviral therapy and the virus does not return for at least uh, two years after that. So absent that, the discussion and the excitement should be on the activity, but not on the fact that the data is available to suggest that the cure is right next to us. Uh, I would agree with uh, everything Dr. Montaner just said. I would focus the attention to whether there is any human element and how long of the, uh, the human, human element has been observed. And then I would further advise people to utilize their, their medical provider, their primary care doctor, their HIV doctor, and bring the article or talk about the article. And that person will also help them to frame where this fits in the, in the overall curative message, that it might not necessarily mean the end, but very beginning of some discovery. Thank you. That's that's incredibly helpful um, because as a person who really appreciates evidence-based uh, research and um, documents and whatnot, I, I always say Facebook is not uh, uh, the best mode of gathering information on a topic, and oftentimes we see um, false information shared. So this was incredible. This was incredibly helpful. The webinar and that answer. Um, we have a few uh, questions in the Q and A box. Um, one in particular. Um, should we call, be calling the London patient cured? It's only been 18 months so far. Shouldn't you have qualified this list? Uh, yes, I, I, perhaps I, it was an oversight to go and label the title on that particular slide, reported HIV cures and HIV cures in quotations. If you go back to the slide, there, there are two uh, uses of the word cure, one with and one without mm -hmm. quotations, because I was trying to reflect that the news coverage has very much portrayed them as cures, mm -hmm. but that the scientific basis to interpret them as cure remains still debatable. So I agree with you that the London patient has yet to prove that it would be in remission or without viral rebound for as long as Tim, as Mr. Brown has been. So we will have to wait and monitor, but at this point, it looks very much uh, similar to uh, Tim Brown's uh, history and experience. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for clar clarifying that. And um, also we will be, we will um, share out the slides and this video for further use. So. Um, you can see that slide um, in future iterations. Um, also, uh, can you speak of the human element? Um, and uh, just to touch upon, we, we are sharing the video premiere at the Prevention Summit on June 11th, which will, will have quite a bit of a human element to it. Um, but also next week, next Friday, we have um, our next webinar in the series, A Day in the Life of a Cure Research Participant. Can you uh, give us a little snippet or a little taste of what um, that webinar is going to entail? Excellent. So a lot of people are intimidated with what they perceive the process of being involved in a clinical trial is. And so the topic next week is hopefully going to answer some questions and to clear up some myths or misconceptions. And it starts from the, the initial inquiry as to research that is available. That is either a conversation a person can have with their doctor or a conversation they have with me. Then it would proceed through the informed consent process. And I highlight that it is a process for, as the document is shared and discussed, and then the individual would then take that document home and refer to it and share it with loved ones and, and trusted advisors before they even begin to consider the trial. And then they're considered for the trial to make sure that it's safe for them to participate. And then the trial itself would begin. And then we talk about how closely monitoring is during that whole phase and that monitoring actually continues even after the end of the trial itself. So we have an end point for the trial where we are no longer giving in someone medications or doing any further testing. 
and now we just bring them in for a period just to check in with them for three or four visits after once a month to ensure that everything returns right back to where they begin. So it's really meant to give a person a clear perspective from the whole continuum of inquiry of a study to being 100% completed the study. Wonderful, wonderful. That's excellent. Um, we have another question. Um, are folks who are incarcerated in Philadelphia, New Jersey, um, being, um, being invited to participate in this study? Uh, this person said this would not only be valuable, um, but um, it would encourage, um, yeah, what did it say, sorry. Um, it would be helpful for these communities. Yes, thank you for that question. I think that uh, when it comes to the process of biomedical research, the process is governed by some guidelines that identify who would be able to provide informed consent to participate mm -hmm. uh, under the expectations of being informed and having the free choice to be on or not being on a study. When it comes to individuals that are incarcerated, they fall under a category that is termed as vulnerable population because their ability to participate is embedded within a personal situation that may limit their free choice. And as a consequence, the requirements for doing research studies in individuals that are incarcerated are very different than those that are available to people that are not incarcerated. So, so we do not extend the studies into those populations due to concerns about the guarantee that they would participate uh, out of free will. Perfect, thank you so much for further clarifying that. Um, so it looks like that is about all for questions. Um, do you two have anything else you would like to add? Yes, I would like to just clarify that, as you mentioned, the Facebook uh, platform and Instagram have been very efficient in giving us uh, late you know, information and having access to multiple networks, mm -hmm. but they also disseminate a lot of misinformation. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to HIV cure directed news or any one uh, story about what may result in a cure, I think that the platform becomes uh, a very vulnerable point of information and misinformation. So I would caution everyone to consult any news that they read with their provider, uh, look to beathiv.org and other places that are trying to be transparent about information for, for confirming whatever is it that they have read or, or been told, because unfortunately there's a lot of uh, efforts underway from individuals that are trying to push ideas that are not founded by science and they're not corroborated by studies, but that doesn't prevent them from sharing it on Facebook or sending it through Instagram. So before you forward anything that relates to an HIV cure within your own network, uh, please confirm that that information is valid and that that information has some basis of truth before you move it forward. Uh, I would like to take an opportunity to just confirm that we are actually pre-screening for individuals for the BEAT2 trial currently. We are looking for individuals who are doing well with their HIV. They're undetectable, they keep their appointments, they have a relatively strong C4, their medical history is not too cumbersome meaning that they don't have uncontrolled diabetes or heart condition or something that would make them not a safe candidate for research. And I would ask everyone who's on the call or anyone watching this video to consider that only 15 years ago, we were dealing with regiments involving 15 pills a day and they often came with many, many side effects. And how we got from those 15 pills to today where many, many people enjoy one or two pills a day, and the answer is research. So someone sat in the chair where a participant might be today and said yes when asked whether they would participate in research. 
And now the question is, are we happy with one or two pills a day? Or will we say yes when asked about research to help move us closer to a day where no pills at all? So if any of that sparked any interest in you, I would love to speak with you. Everything is kept in the greatest of confidence. I am a registered nurse, so it would be covered by HIPAA. And you can reach me at 215-662-8217. 215-662-8217. And I'll have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with anyone who web, who's not sure if, if research is right for them. And then I can help to get some background and we will decide what's the best way for you to get involved. Are you a participant? Are you a community uh, ambassador? Or potentially a future member of our community advisory board? So hopefully this conversation has moved you for some introspection. And I look forward to speaking to anyone who would like to talk. Wonderful, wonderful. This was absolutely excellent. And if anyone has anything else they would like to say, or if anyone, if, if that is all, um, we are going to proceed to end this webinar. And, um, but I want to remind everyone to join us next Friday for um, a day in the life of a CURE research participant and join us June 11th at the Prevention Summit um, where you can meet and talk to many of the uh, uh, collaboratory members at the Prevention Summit at a uh, various number of workshops. So thank you so much everyone for participating and uh, we'll see you next Friday and we'll hopefully see you on June 11th at the Pennsylvania Convention Center from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m.